Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Maggie Marr. Yes, we do. Maggie's an author and she's also an entertainment attorney, which uh, was so, she just was, gave such great information, Mm -hmm. both from the writing perspective, but also from the perspective of if you have a book and you want to sell the lot rights for film or TV, um, it was just amazing information. Just so good. Yeah. She has a way of explaining things Mm -hmm. and we talk about a really good way of explaining things. And we talk about like negotiation and when, Mm -hmm. how to find an entertainment lawyer and why you need one and kind of how to vet one and figure out if they're a good one or not. Yep. And uh, lots of good stuff. And then we talked about, you know, like deals and negotiation. Mm -hmm. And so really good. Yeah. It was awesome. It was awesome. So what have you been doing this week? Well, I am editing my book. I'm in my happy place. The book is, the draft is finished and I'm editing it, which just Mm -hmm. makes me so happy because I don't like drafting as much as I like editing. So I'm doing that. And um, I'm starting to record some episodes of mystery books podcast. That's the one I do seasonally. Yeah. So hopefully I'll get that going again. Um, Yeah. Doing stuff like that. It's been a good week. What about you? Good. Well, (laughs) <laughs> I'm starring in Grey's Anatomy. Um, oh, no. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, so we got home from our conference last week, and uh, I knew I was coming to my daughter's this week to help for a few days because her husband's out of town. And But then um, on Sunday, she just messaged and said, I have 103 fever, and three of the kids have fever as well. So I just came, and oh. so I've been trying to help. Uh, her because she's still very ill. She has the flu. Uh, thank, oh. It's not COVID, thankfully, but the flu, it's just knocked her out. I've known her for 28 years and mm. I've never seen her this sick. So, wow. um, yeah, I'm just praying I don't get it. And <laughs> the kids are all better. So that's good. But so that's what I'm doing. I'm not oh. really doing much of anything, just doing some consulting all week, which has mm-hmm. been just so fun. And Getting to record this podcast today was just awesome, and uh, we have another great one tomorrow. So, yeah, yeah. that's and, what I'm doing. Yeah. So, oh, and we should also mention mm-hmm. um, Inkers Con. Jamie and yes. I are both going to be at Inkers Con in June, in December. So, mm-hmm. um, we've we're going to be speaking on a panel and, with Kimber Swain. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so, if anybody else is going to be there, you know, drop it in the Facebook group, and mm-hmm. maybe we can coordinate getting together for coffee or lunch or dinner or something because I'm sure we'll have some free time to eat at a conference because that's like what you do right you go that's what you do and we would love to see (laughs) people that listen to the podcast and um yeah we're very excited we're gonna do a panel on series and uh Kimber's gonna do it with us and she's just a great urban fantasy paranormal author and so it's gonna be fun yeah. So that was our announcement for this week. I think that's yeah. one thing that we're looking forward to. And it, I it think is. we should maybe get to the interview and hear yeah. what Maggie has to say. Yeah, it's awesome. All right. Here's Maggie. Well, today we are really excited to talk with Maggie Marr. Hi, Maggie. How are you? Hi, I'm, I'm good. Thank you for having me. We're so excited you're here. <laughs> We have so many questions, (laughs) but first I'm going to read your bio. Uh, Maggie Marr is the USA Today bestselling author of hot contemporary romance. She spends her days working in in entertainment and her nights writing. Maggie loves all things pop culture. And when she isn't writing, she's reading or binge watching Netflix. I identify with that. (laughs) I think we all do. (laughs) So how did you get into writing, Maggie? Um, You know, it's interesting. I feel like I've been a writer since I was a kid. I think I started Mm -hmm. my first book when I was eight years old. And it was, I remember the first scene, it was this woman in a limousine. And I think it must have been loosely based on my mother's romance books that I used to steal. So (laughs) I've always been a writer. Um, 
But I grew up in the Midwest, you know, and in the Midwest, there were no templates for that kind of career mm-hmm. as far mm-hmm. as my family was concerned. So since I was good with words, I was steered towards the law. Whereas if I mm-hmm. had been really good in math and science, I probably would have been steered towards medicine. Mm-hmm. So Wow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I had the same thing happen to me. People were like, oh, you like to write? You're an English major? You should go to law school. And right. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. <laughs> well, what is your definition of success? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think success for me is living a life that is fulfilling as mm-hmm. well as being of service to my community. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And being able to pay my bills. There's that. Yeah, well, that's right. There's that too. <laughs> small yeah, thing not, there. Let's not gloss that over, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Do you think that's changed um, over the last few years with everything going on? Or have you always been really service minded like that? Um, I think it probably came to the forefront. I, I believe that when the kids were younger and there was more struggle for us mm-hmm. as a family that success was just at the end of the month, being able to stretch the (laughs) dollars to cover the bills. Yeah. Um, As the kids have gotten older and I have more time for myself again, I feel like I've been able to pivot and really look, okay, so for the next hopefully 40 years, what do I really want to do and how am I going to measure a successful life? Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, What do you wish you'd known about writing and craft when you started? Oh, I wish I had known about writing and craft that you're never going to be finished with learning <laughs> <laughs> about your writing that is and so craft. True. That is and there's so not going to be a goal line. Mm-hmm. I think I, in that, in that, that goal line, I remember that goal line keeps moving, yeah. right? Like it, it was, Oh, I'll just get the first book finished. And then it was, I just want the first publishing deal. And then it was, I just want my letters. And then it was, <laughs> I just want, you know, there's always that goal mm-hmm. keeps moving mm-hmm. for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the things that's cool about this career is that Mm -hmm. you, you can pivot and change your goals, but then even when doing that, there's other things that you're like, Oh, now I can try and do this, or maybe I can reach this goal. So yeah, it's really good. If you're a learner, I don't know if you do Clifton strengths, but. Oh um, yeah, I did do that. And I don't (laughs) think learner was one of my, my top 10 but I definitely have str- strategy strategic, mm. I think is in my top three and I feel oh. as though, and futuristic. And I feel like those two things oh. together compel me to constantly be looking yeah. for new things. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be absolutely that'd be great combination for a writer. Yes. <laughs> Speaking as someone that doesn't have any executive strengths in her top five. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about marketing? What do you wish you'd known about marketing? Oh, <laughs> sometimes I think instead of that poli sci history degree, I wish I was, had been a marketing major. Yeah, it seems like a number of independent authors who are particularly good at marketing have that background. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it can be overemphasized how important marketing is, and not just from the level of us. I was going to say intentionally doing it, meaning when I think intentionally. Mm-hmm meaning ads and things like that, but there is an mm-hmm. unintentional part of marketing that goes with brand. Mm-hmm. I've had this conversation with uh, other authors. In fact, I spoke on it once where I was the walking poster child for every mistake that any author could possibly make. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because I did the genre hopping. I yes. did the not continuing with my book series. I did yes. all of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, realizing that you want to do enough or a lot so that the readers can find you and understand what you're always going to be delivering to them. Right. Right. That is so true. That is so true. Sarah and I were at a, uh, like a workshop, very small conference mastermind sort of thing Mm -hmm. last week. And um, that's what we were talking, you know, your brand is that promise you make to the reader. And so you need to, you know, you just need to be fulfilling that promise all the time and, and uh, making sure that's out there. And um, yeah, a lot of people don't get that. I think that's, that's hard. I think sometimes you you don't know what it is for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think that it's hard? I, I have sometimes think about too, and I, I will talk about this with my clients. Sometimes there's this idea of um, 
business versus creative, right? Like Mm -hmm. there is some respect that has to be given to our creative selves too, Mm -hmm. right? If you are completely tired of writing thrillers, then what do you need to do kind of as a palate cleanser to be able to continue to write the thing the the market loves you for? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. I mean, I did that with my bride's Mm -hmm. books. I had four bride's books. I was kind of like, there's just not another way to run away from a wedding without these women being <laughs> complete jerks. So, I mean, I was sort of out of ideas and I really wanted to write this other small town mm-hmm. kind of sportsy thing. And it's, I, I think in the long run, it will be fun. It will be a good thing, but it was, it didn't have, it just didn't, I've talked about this a lot, but it didn't have the oomph that I was hoping mm-hmm. for that the brides did. And I think mm-hmm. it's because the brides are what people were used to, but my new series still is a Jamie Albright series. It has mm-hmm. all the things that Jamie Albright promises readers. Mm-hmm. So, but I think it takes a while for readers to figure that out. And, uh, you know, so I, I get it. I did the same thing because I just was out of bride's ideas. I just couldn't figure out another way for them to run away. So um, I've had a few more now, so that helps just to get in the way. Yeah. Sometimes you have to step back and yes. like I've done that. I thought I've been all out of some ideas for a certain series. And then after a while, I'm like, you know, I could write one more book, you know, yeah. I've getting one more idea <laughs> in that series. So, but you've changed, you've pivoted, haven't mm-hmm. you Maggie, a little bit from like, what what have you how have you changed in your writing? Yeah, so the the first two books were traditionally published out of New York, and they were women's fiction with a little bit of a thriller component. Uh, and then it was my agent at the time who suggested that I probably, in part because I was very prolific in my ability mm-hmm. to write, might really love romance. And I started mm-hmm. reading them and remembered how much I loved them. Mm-hmm. And so I pivoted into romance. And just as I was starting to get traction on sort of these billionaire books, then I decided I would pivot to new adult. And just as I started getting traction on those, I decided I would pivot yet again. And so, and it was, um, and I'll never forget, I was at a small conference and we had all gone to dinner, as you do with writers Mm -hmm. conferences. And I was telling a writer who had a, a more successful career financially than I did about this. And she looked at me and she said, you must not like money. (laughs) <laughs> no <laughs> and it was one of those light bulb moments where you almost feel like you've been hit in the head and you go oh that's oh. pretty obvious right now now that you said that <laughs> that I should have ridden those series to the very bitter end instead yeah, of yeah. hopping around you yeah. know that's so funny well, what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and looking back did they turn out to be right or wrong Well, you know, the Hollywood Girls Club, the first book, it sold at auction and it was a a pretty lucrative deal. And I Mm -hmm. I think I made the assumption that 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 would continue, Mm -hmm. (laughs) even though I had represented writers and directors and book authors. And I would say the words often to them, you know, 30 percent to the government, live on 30 percent, 30 percent to savings. The other 10 percent you can play with. Hopefully you'll invest it because you never know whether or not the next book will be a successful one or the next movie or the next script. Um, And for some reason, I could not apply that to myself. I kind of assumed that there would be no, everything would be up. It would be a a trajectory to the sky, a flight to the stars. (laughs) And we all know as creative people and as authors that a creative career oftentimes looks more like a roller coaster Mm -hmm. and less like, um, a rocket ship. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that a lot of times it's maybe exactly not, true. it may not be the decisions you made. It may be the market changes mm-hmm. and you may find yourself going down on that roller coaster that you didn't. Right. Well, that's, it. that's exactly <laughs> what happened when Hollywood girls came out. Girls club came out in 2008. It was a book about women wearing very expensive shoes, working in yeah. Hollywood, um, wearing a very having very expensive bags and a very sort of posh lifestyle, and that was when the economic crash hit. Oh, yeah, shit. so not really. Yeah, so timing, the timing, huh? yeah, the timing was not so great on that book. You know, yeah, people really did not want to read about. I, I didn't want to read about that posh lifestyle mm-hmm. while the economy was kind of tanking. Yeah. yeah, yeah, or someone like releasing a 
book about traveling, you know, these women traveling around the world when COVID hit, I could imagine yes. that would not go over as well either. Thankfully, I didn't do that, but <laughs> I could have, could have easily. Right. right. <laughs> could have been me (laughs) well we like to talk about like mistakes made and lessons learned Mm -hmm. and things so one of the things we always like to ask is um have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing I'm sure I have (laughs) made I know I've made tons of mistakes you know I mean intentional or not I think that the fact that Hollywood Girls Club did not it was not kind of it it was not as successful as everyone had hoped it would be whether that was Mm -hmm. timing or whatever it did propel me into a different trajectory that built up my craft as well Mm -hmm. as my community around me Mm -hmm. oh that's great because what happened was is that you know I pivoted to romance and I started in that world already being published but I developed my closest friendships in that community and developed my craft in that community um, and then once again, was uh, what, what had happened, you guys may already know this story, what had happened was, is that when I left agenting at ICM, I thought I was going to write full time, but my clients would still ask me to look at things. Mm-hmm. And then when I was writing what I thought was full time, when my friends figured out that I understood entertainment because of my background as a former motion picture agent, they started mm-hmm. asking me to do those deals. So that kind of grew up around me, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, yep. so I don't know if it was a mistake as much as an organic sort of growth that took For a transition. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was one of those people that was like, Hey Maggie, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> I have no shame. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's okay. Because, you know, the thing is, is that as I read things, while I may not have a know of or have a buyer for that particular material at the time mm-hmm. I sure as heck know that if somebody says to me have you read a good bride book mm-hmm. <laughs> I can yeah, say run I, away bride. <laughs> I know exactly which book you need to to read yes. you know yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. which is yeah. great which is great <laughs> uh, so what about the opposite have you ever had something uh, you thought was a brilliant idea and it turned out not to be so great we all have those like every day I think I I mean a brilliant idea that didn't turn out so great absolutely I'm trying to it's hard for me to pinpoint just one though for you (laughs) (laughs) what is that brilliant idea that didn't turn out so great I don't know you know I did um in my early days when I was a baby agent I with another agent, we kind of were thinking about doing a script analysis company mm-hmm. and we just didn't have kind of the, the elbow grease and the ability to do it perhaps yeah. because we were both in the early phases of motherhood as well. Oh. Yeah. 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 Nor, <laughs> nor did you have the brain cells. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a crazy time of life. So yeah, probably not the best time to start. Right. A new project like that. (laughs) Totally can see that. Well, you've done a lot of different things. And um, what's the biggest uh, mindset change you've had to make during your career, do you think? I don't know if it's a mindset change as much as it's an idea that I've been lucky enough that almost everything that I've done in my professional career leads to the same sort of place and that story right? How to, mm-hmm. how to tell or find a home for a story. Mm-hmm. So I think it started at age eight when I was a writer. And so that was learning that I love story and I know how to write a story. And then going to law school when I was um, a guardian ad litem and worked in domestic violence, it was learning how to craft a story that you tell to a jury because I did that. And then always writing. Writing has always been my companion. Um, so using that and then at the agency, agency representing other creatives, that was learning how to help them find a home for their story, but also use the business component and the legal background to strategize as to what is, where's is the best place? What does that deal look like? And then now I feel like my life is all of that. Like all of those elements have kind of come into one place and that's yeah. what I do all the time. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great answer and a great segue into our next question, which is how, how does an author or 
I guess anyone, but we're talk we talk to mm-hmm. authors, uh, vet and find literary slash entertainment attorneys. I mean, yeah. I think that's a big question a lot of the time. And a lot of us don't have an answer for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I want to, there's a couple things. I think that it's really important. One of the things that I want to touch upon here is that as an author, if you want somebody to try to sell your film and TV rights into entertainment, make sure they've done it before, mm-hmm. right? Like, like right. make sure it's taken 22 years for me to build up the contacts that I have in the entertainment yeah. industry. And I started in the mailroom. And I started in the mailroom after I had already had a full docket as a litigator, right? And the day I started in the mailroom, there were, I think it was three or four other attorneys and one PhD, and we were all pushing the mail cart, right? And so we were able to, sorry, we were able to use that, um, I'm able to use those contacts that I gained from that time in the mailroom and then also becoming an agent. And now so many of my former contacts, they, they have big jobs in entertainment. Mm -hmm. So I lean into those relationships to place books into film and TV. Mm -hmm. So it's not to say that somebody who's never done a deal before can't do a deal, but I would definitely interview the person and ask them if they've done the deal before. And then the next thing is, is that if you use an agent or a literary manager, I still think that you're I still think that it's in your best interest to have an entertainment attorney redliner look at your deal Mm -hmm. Um, that you can put into Google entertainment attorneys and a million of them will pop up. There are some bigger firms in entertainment that represent a lot of screenplay writers, directors, and actors. Any one of those entertainment attorneys will do. Uh, if I'm not the right fit for you, I'm happy to give you names of other entertainment attorneys that are good at what they do. Um, entertainment is, um, it's like a, it's like a small town in a big city. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So if I haven't at this point, if I don't know somebody, at least I know somebody who does know somebody, mm-hmm. right. it feels yeah. like. Yeah. And then I, I have to ask, you know, you have to, a lot of people will say to me, how do I get represented so that my books can be sold into film and TV? Well, um, there's a there's a number of ways. One of the things I think, which I've been saying a lot to authors, is help film executives find you and do that by putting everywhere that you are or your books are or on all your social media, put for film and TV inquiries, oh. colon, and then an email address. And it should be an email address that you're going to monitor because (laughs) the first question any development executive is going to ask you if they're interested in your books is, are the film and TV rights available? Because if the film and TV rights are already under option or they've already been sold, then that development executive is probably not going to spend um, the time and energy to dive into your material Mm -hmm. because they're not going to be able to facilitate the production of that material. Yeah. Right. right. Sorry, and that's I such a, was no, all that's, over the place. No, that's no good. I think that's great. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's such a simple thing to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, you know, we, I have a tendency to, you know, to think, Oh, let's, let's create this grand plan for whatever project I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And that's something that's very simple that everybody can do. And yeah, I think that's a great advice. So I was going to ask real quickly, if you would define just so mm-hmm. in case people don't understand, what does it mean when you redline a contract? Oh, yeah. So when a buyer presents a contract to, um, let's just use names. So say Netflix wants to purchase your film and TV rights for a production company that has an overall deal. So they'll, the negotiations have already taken place. You've closed on the numbers and Netflix conveys a contract, an agreement to you for the purchase of your film and TV rights. So that agreement, as is the case with all buyers, is conveyed in the best interest of the buyer, right? (laughs) So the entertainment attorney (laughs) is meant to read that agreement and go through it and mark it up and redline it so that while you may not get everything you want for your client, you're at least trying to make the language more beneficial for the author 
than it was when it originally came from business affairs at Netflix. Mm-hmm. And, okay. and I find this particularly important, less so with the, well, it's important always, it's important with the purchase. But one of the things that's really interesting is that I just did the other day get uh, an attachment agreement from a producer. I'd never seen anything like this. And what it did was there was language in there that allowed for if the producer during the attachment period created anything like a sizzle reel um, a pitch deck based on the book that instead of those items being frozen at the end of the attachment period, as they should be, because as you know, you can't exploit those items unless you pick up the underlying rights to the underlying book or intellectual mm-hmm. property. Mm-hmm. There was language in there that allowed for those items to then have their own copyright and the producer own those items and could exploit those items without ever having to pick up the underlying intellectual property. Oh, wow. And to me, that was beyond the pale. I'd never yeah. seen, I had never seen anything like that. And this is why we need entertainment attorneys yeah. to look things yeah. over because yeah, that's pretty, that's. I, I mean, okay. Like that's ballsy. Grab, right? That's what I'm yeah. going to say. It's ballsy. <laughs> it was a horrible yeah. rights grab on behalf of the yeah. producer and, and it was struck and taken out, but but I have seen things in agreements where, you know, the producer might, if they attach an element, then they are attached to the project in perpetuity. Mm-hmm. I've seen agreements wow. that are much too long. I've seen all kinds of things come by my desk. And then I've also seen from the other side, um, people who come to me after they've signed the agreement and they're in a predicament that, that you can't really, it's going to be tough to extricate them. From. So I think it's it's wise if you're going to enter into an agreement that's going to impact the rights to your book, have someone else look at it. So I think that is all such good advice. And one thing I wanted to mention here is one thing I've had to learn doing a bunch of contracts is it's they expect dialogue when they when people send you a contract. And I think as writers, we're a lot of times we're so afraid to ask for anything mm-hmm. and it's expected that there's going to be a negotiation, right? I mean, they expect a back and forth. Mm-hmm. So that's not unusual. <laughs> no, I think I a think lot of us really feel a- like we have to take what we're offered and that's not you true. Absolutely do not. I mean, I think it's really important to understand. I think one of the reasons that writers or creatives, we do, we tend to want to take whatever we're offered is because um, you spend so many years trying to get anyone to acknowledge your creative endeavors that right. when somebody does with a contract, it's it's hard to ask for what you want because you're so excited that they want it. Um, the thing is, is that there is a rhythm and generally it's important to go back and forth with the other side to try to make the deal better than the original offer and also to make the language so that it is more beneficial to the author and that it protects their rights. I've yet to see a deal memo that comes in that is exactly <laughs> to the author's benefit on the first pass, unless it comes from the author themselves, meaning, or from their representative, right? right. Yeah. So, and you're not going to lose the deal, right? Like, right. You that's the, the thing. Side, that's what we're afraid of. We're let gonna the other side the tell you no. Yeah. Right. Like that's a big that was a big lesson for me. And and I have to tell you, I'm not so good at it for myself, but I'm really good at it for my clients. <laughs> Let the other side be the side that tells you no. Yeah. I mean, here, yeah. I'll give you an yeah. example. I love this example. I had two uh, creators who had signed an attachment agreement before they met me. And so the studio has just had decided to board the project. And so that means that they're going to really negotiate the purchase price and the option agreement and all that. So business affairs from the studio reaches out and they offer, um, they offered $50,000 <clears> for the purchase price. And I went back to him and, and I said, it should be a million. You, you need to pay them a million dollars. And so the business affairs lit up my phone and he's like, we're not even in the same ballpark. I said, but here's the thing. I said, did they tell you the value of this project? You already have a showrunner. You already have this. You already have a distributor. Um, it's a demographic that is underserved. It's the type of material that that demographic very much wants. I'm like $50,000 is not an appropriate purchase price for this material. Considering the package that you've developed, a million is a lot closer He's like, okay, okay, I'll go back. I didn't know all of that, but it's not going to be a million. 
And I'm like, okay, well, get back to me. I feel like you really, you, the offer was below the value of the project. So while we didn't get a million dollars, we got mid six figures and mid six figures is a lot different than 50,000. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. So it was like 10 times what the original offer was. Now, I would argue that one of the reasons people hire me or someone like me is because of their market knowledge. It's okay. not just about, well, two things, redlining an entertainment deal is different than a real estate deal is different than an estate is different right. than a will is different than. So I say this um, to people all the time. If you get an offer, try to find someone who understands entertainment deal memos because there is template language within entertainment deal memos and you need to know what will and won't be changeable. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing, one of the reasons I said before is that you want somebody who's done a deal before is that you're going to lean into your contacts and you're going to lean into your market knowledge to know the value of the underlying intellectual property, as well as the attachments that have been added to the project. And then you're going to know comps in the marketplace. What did Netflix pay for that last deal that they did? And if I don't know it, can I get to, or do I know somebody on the team that I can reach out and say, Hey, what, what did you get on that deal? Yeah. It's very much like buying a house. You wouldn't buy a house without knowing the comps, you know, you have to know the comps and know your market. So yeah, Yeah. I think that's all great advice. Um, Yeah. Is there anything else you wish authors knew about reaching out to an, um, an entertainment attorney. I mean, those were great um, things. But oh, well, thank you. Yeah, no. I mean, the thing is, is that every entertainment attorney is a little bit different, right? As is every manager and every agent. I think it's important to realize that they work for you, right? Like right. the entertainment attorney works for the author, the manager works for the author, the agent works for the author. That you're the boss. That doesn't mean you have to be a bad boss, but you're the boss. And as the boss, it's important to ask questions. Um, don't be afraid to ask those questions. Right. Um, I think that's really important. I, I do hear this a lot from authors that sometimes they feel very comfortable with me because I know that that writers are the smartest people in the room mm-hmm. because if publishers and movie studios could do things without writers, they probably would. So <laughs> yeah. writers are the smartest yeah. people in the room and they're much needed. But right. from other authors, I will hear... Um, I like working with you, Maggie, because I know if I ask a question, you don't think I'm stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And I think a lot of times we are afraid to ask the questions. Yeah. We're afraid mm-hmm. to ask what else have you sold or, you know, mm-hmm. how, who, you know, what references do you have? And right. it's okay. Right. That's one thing we have to get over, I think, as authors. Yeah. yeah. And and the other thing is, is that there are times when a producer will come some th- for something and they may not have a lot of credits and I'll have a conversation with a client and I'll say, they don't have a lot of credits, but they have a lot of hustle and they know the industry and they have a lot of enthusiasm. So, and then the other thing is, is that ultimately every decision is up to the author, right? Like you can bring an author a deal, you can walk them through it and talk to them about the project, but if it's not a fit, it's not a fit, right? You have the ability to walk away at any time. And I think that's really important. And and there are times when a film and TV deal may not be right for an author. Um, One of the questions I get is, will they change my book? Yes. Yes, they will change your book. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They will change your book. And if, and if that's, um, if that is a place that you are uncomfortable, then maybe a film and TV deal is not the right deal. Mm -hmm. Um, Can I control the changes that they make? Probably not. You know, I mean, not even directors get final cut, yeah. right? So you figure if if somebody is spending, you know, two to ten million dollars for an episode to right. to create an episode of an episodic, they're not necessarily going to let the author be the individual that determines what that episode looks like. There right. are certain authors, I'm sure, that get a lot of say. Yeah, but. Yeah, but even something... like Bridgerton, I mean, if you look at Bridgerton, which I'm sure she had, I mean, she has clout. It, I mean, and Julia Quinn. And, um, but the second 
The first but season wasn't like it. Well, I don't know. Does she? I don't know. To Shonda Rhimes, does she? No, she does not. Right. And yeah. and so the second ep- the second season for sure was the bones of the book, mm-hmm. but it was not the book. I mean, no. like from the pretty much from the middle on, it was really the book. And but it's still entertaining. I yeah. I still enjoyed it. But it's you know that's what I'm. People just have to let go of that. I think so. Film and TV is incredibly collaborative. It's mm-hmm. not. It's not like writing a book. It, I mean, we can remember from the trad when you could set any change that your editors suggested, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You don't have that with film and TV. Meaning that um, with that many people involved, because you know, when I was an agent, I would say to people, if you if you want your words to be changed without any consideration for you become a film screenplay writer. If you want to have more control, become a showrunner on an episode, yeah. <laughs> but you have to work your way up to showrunner, yeah. which means you work your way up through the writer's yeah. room. Right. Um, if you want to have complete control over anything you put on a page, become a book author. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it's it's really the least collaborative. And now as an indie author, it's even more so. You know, you guide yeah. your own ship entirely Correct. on your own. Correct. You have a lot but, more control. Yeah. But it's also the difference between the production costs. If you think about <laughs> if a movie's gonna cost $120 million to make, then that screenplay writer is not gonna have all the control over the script. If an episode of an episodic is gonna be five to seven million dollars, they're you know, it goes through the writer's room, it goes through the showrunner, it goes through the executives, it goes through the director, it goes through the actors, there's, it's a much more collaborative sort of endeavor. Yeah, and it does make sense that they're not going to give up final approval to one person in that, (laughs) that thing. And I don't mean to minimize Julia Quinn at all. She's a brilliant writer who wrote a brilliant series, but it's a very collaborative medium, um, you know, yeah, and it gives, yeah. I can see why they would want to have the freedom to do what they need to do to make it the best that they think it will be, like the producers. And it's, and, yeah. it's, diff- it's a different media, too. Like, so yeah. I'm, I'm going through yeah. a process right now where we have a book series and Warner Brothers is boarding the project and there's a showrunner. It's taken us five years to find the right showrunner. And now we're going to go, the showrunner is going to go and pitch it to distributors, right? Mm-hmm. So while the book author is participatory, the pitch for the book series is different than the books, but the showrunner is a showrunner who's had a number of very successful series. And much like a book author understands what their readers want, a showrunner mm. knows what elements out of those books will play to a bigger audience. And that bigger audience is necessary to sustain the cost of the show. Yes, that is so much, good. Yes, yeah, that as much just as, makes so much sense. Yeah. yeah, as much as we are bibliophiles and we love to read, I mean, I read some horrible statistic once that said that like what 75% of people don't read a book after they get out of high school. Right. Right. Which is crazy to us probably because, you know, on a good week I could read two, you know, (laughs) (laughs) or three maybe. Right. And write one and and do your job. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's changing that sort of written word in one format to a format that is accessible to all the people that don't read as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Go ahead, Sarah. Oh, I was just going to say, um, what you said you have a book coming out about pitching yeah. and about authors in Hollywood. So we want to have you back on to talk about Thank that you. when that comes out. But is there anything else like just that you think authors need to know about pitching to Hollywood? We've already covered a lot that mm-hmm. would be, that I think is going to be helpful. Any other big picture tips? Well, I, I mean, because people, I did hear, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Wait, no, please. I did hear you say at Ram one time that having a screenplay mm-hmm. helps. Is that still the case or it is that help. even the case? Yeah. I think so. If I, when I was an agent, I would have said to book authors, don't do your own adaptation. I don't think that's going to get you anywhere, but that has changed a little bit. And there's a caveat as to why. So right now in the film industry, there's a new streamer 
it feels like every month and there is tons mm-hmm. of capital capital being dumped into film and TV. And there's a lot of hours that need to be filled, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's mm-hmm. so much content that is necessary for all of those distributors, studios, and streamers. So <clears throat> if you've ever wanted to write a screenplay, now is a good time to do it. It doesn't mean that it will sell. Here's something that I think is really important for authors to realize is that as much time that you dedicated and devoted to building your craft as a book author, screenplay writers have dedicated and devoted the same amount of time or more to their craft of screenplay writing. Mm -hmm. And just because you're a really good book author, it doesn't always convert into being a really good screenplay writer. So I think it's, I think it's really important to acknowledge that these are two different skill sets and you can become as good as screenplay writing, perhaps as you are at being a book author, but you're going to have to devote time and energy to up your game in that, that craft, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's different. Mm -hmm. So that being said, say you really want to adapt, you really want to adapt your own book to film. Why not give it a try, but do it unless you already have a lot of credits or unless you've already studied the craft of screenplay writing, do it with the caveat that it may or may not sell that if the book does sell into film and TV, the producer or the studio who picks it up may not want your script, especially if they have another writer in mind for the project. Right. So, um, so it can be, it could be helpful, but I'm not saying that it always is. I am saying that now with, the need for so much content, there's more likelihood than there would have been say five or 10 years ago that that script might get picked up. Very interesting. Yeah. 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 Yeah, It's hard to believe there's not a streaming service that wants runaway brides. I'm just saying. (laughs) (laughs) And they might, I mean, here's the other thing is that I don't know. I don't think we touched on this, you know, any more books, unless it's a book that is a huge breakout book, like say uh, it's a Stephen King title or a Neil Mm -hmm. Gaiman title or Mm -hmm. a title that is really, really big. Most Mm -hmm. books right now don't just sell with to a studio or streamer without some sort of attachment or some Mm -hmm. sort of development, even producers Mm -hmm. that have overall deals, they may be, they're picking up books with an option, but then they're, trying to find the showrunner for it. They're trying to develop the take. They could be attaching a director. They might be attaching a screenplay writer. They could be attaching an actor. And then they're taking it to the studio or streamer and laying it off with all of those elements already attached instead of just walking in a book with no other attachments directly to the studio or streamer. There has to be more of a vision in place. Yes. Yeah, Yeah. I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. Because there is so much, too. You know, I mean, yeah. there's, it's kind of like the indie market right now, a little <laughs> bit flooded with, with information. And stuff. So we will have you back on to talk oh, about your book. You. We're so excited about that. Thanks. And, uh, but what is the best thing you think you've done to set yourself up for success? Oh, what a good question. Um. That's why we end with the best thing I've done to set myself up for success is to try to consistently do, do good work and be sincere. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, Yeah. So, and setting goals, whatever they are, I think that's that strategic futuristic in me. Like there's, there's always a goal. There's always something else that I want to explore something else that I want to do. Um, and never feeling like I know it all because I can't, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Great answer. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, where can people find out more about you, about your books oh, and yeah. also about your legal services? Oh yeah. So I have a website. It's www.maggiemarlegal.com. Um, and it has all of the ways that you can get a hold of me. Um, we've also started a YouTube channel, mm-hmm. which is Maggie Mar. So we're doing, um, we're doing videos once a week that kind of Mm -hmm. talk about different elements of entertainment books, subsidiary rights, trademark, copyright, all of those things. I think that are interesting to not just book authors, but creatives in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then you can always email me, you know, Maggie (laughs) at Maggie Okay. Perfect. 
right. And your books, where can we find those? Oh, those are, yeah, those are on Amazon for sure. And <laughs> a number of them are in KU. So Very good. just yeah. under right. Maggie Marr. I did not use a pin name. <laughs> I used my real name. So. There you go. Okay. Well, we will have all those links in the show notes and you can find those at wish I'd known them podcast.com. So thanks for listening today. Thanks for being with us and we will see everybody next week. Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to the wish I'd known then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.